After a half day's walk, I arrived where I came to the village. The tree was there waiting for me in Virtue Street. It continued its lessons. To live in harmony with nature, that's where we left with the sage. This is the ultimate end a person can achieve. To live in harmony consistently, in agreement, or in accordance with nature is to fulfill the proper function of your nature as an individual and as part of the whole. I want you to meet the four virtues. Wisdom, represented by the owl. Next is justice. Fighting a lion on the roof is Hercules, who represents courage. And at the end is temperance, carefully pouring her jug of water. As was previously explained, for rational beings, the Stoics believe humans have the ability to obtain a coherent system of knowledge of the universe. To do so is to reach the full potential of what you are. But humans are also by nature social beings, born for the sake of other humans, so importantly, their full potential also lies in knowing how to be social. Knowledge of how to act appropriately as rational and social beings is the same as virtue. This knowledge is obtained from the discipline of logic, and the virtues are what they are because of what the universe is, what you are, and what your relationship is to the universe. This comes from the subject of physics. A person who's achieved this knowledge will be virtuous. They will know how to be wise, just, courageous, and self-controlled. All these are required to fulfill your role in the cosmos. You need wisdom in the pursuit of truth, justice in giving others what is due, courage in doing what is difficult, and self-control in your desires. Because knowledge is a coherent system, without any one of these virtues, all the rest would fail as well. To have one virtue is to have them all. The Stoics famously believe that virtue is the only good and vice the only bad. To understand the Stoics here, we must understand it was the belief that the universe was the only good. Here the Stoics mean by good something that is perfect. People often say today that things less than perfect are also good. Just try to take it as a technical term and put aside your modern definition for now. The reason why the universe is perfect is because it completely realizes all its potential, which occurs through the unfolding of fate. So as explained before, one who develops a coherent system of knowledge fully realizes their own nature as a rational being. They are harmonized with the one thing, the only thing there is, which is also perfect and therefore good. They can then also be said to be perfect and good. Therefore, people who lack a coherent system of catalytic beliefs are less than perfect and thus ignorant. This is vice. They are ignorant, unjust, cowardly, and intemperate. I now wish for you to go to the park, where you will find a man named Epictetus lecturing under a pavilion. I did as the tree said, and found a man there speaking to observers. I listened in on his lecture, which seemed to be on how logic helps one lead an ethical life. For we come into this world without having an innate conception of a right-angled triangle, or of a quarter-tone or half-tone in music, but learn what these things are through some kind of systematic instruction, so that, for that reason, those who have no knowledge of them don't suppose that they know anything about them. But who among us enters the world without having an innate conception of what is good and bad, right and wrong, appropriate and inappropriate, and of happiness, and of what we ought to do and ought not to do? The onlookers nodded in contemplative agreement. One of them raised their hand and asked, But why is it that I don't know right or wrong? Is it that I don't have preconceptions in this regard? No, you do. Is it that I fail to apply them to particular cases? No, you do apply them. So I don't apply them properly? The whole question turns on that, and it is here that opinion enters in. For people start from these generally acknowledged principles, but then get involved in disputes because they fail to apply them in an appropriate way to particular cases. If, in addition to these general principles, they also possessed the knowledge that is required to apply them correctly, what could keep them from being perfect? How can I apply them properly? Know this. Some things are within our power, while others are not. Within our power are opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and, in a word, whatever is of our own doing. Not within our power are our body, our property, reputation, office, and, in a word, whatever is not of our own doing. And the things not in our power are called externals, as you spoke of yesterday? 
Yes, and so my principal task in life is this, to distinguish between things and establish a division between them and say, external things are not within my power, choice is within my power. Where am I to seek the good and bad? Within myself and that which is my own. What then, are we to treat these externals, like our body, in a careless fashion because they are indifferent? Not at all. For that is again bad for our faculty of choice, and thus contrary to nature. Externals are indifferent, but the use one makes of them is by no means indifferent. But if they are indifferent, how am I to know of what use to make of them? Chrysippus did well to say, As long as the consequences remain unclear to me, I always hold to what is best fitted to secure such things as are in accordance with nature. For God himself, in creating me, granted me the freedom to choose them. But if I in fact knew that illness had been decreed for me at this moment by destiny, I would welcome even that. For the foot, too, if it had standing, would be eager to get splattered with mud. It was then that I piped up and asked, So some externals are in accordance with nature? He turned to me and continued. How can we say that some externals are in accordance with nature and others contrary to it? It is as if we are asking the question in isolation. Thus, I will say that it is natural for the foot to be clean, taken in isolation. But if you consider it as a foot, not in isolation, it will be appropriate for it also to step into mud and trample on thorns and sometimes to even to be cut off for the sake of the body as a whole. We should think in some such way about ourselves also. What are you? A human being. Now, if you consider yourself in isolation, it is natural for you to live to an advanced age, to be rich, and to enjoy good health. But if you consider yourself as a human being and as part of some whole, it may be in the interest of the whole that you should now fall ill, now suffer poverty, and perhaps die before your time. Ah. I think I understand, I said to him. As long as I don't know how externals like my body fit into the interests of the whole, it is natural for me to prefer health over being sick. The same goes for other externals as well. I would prefer to have friends and disprefer having no friends, as I am a social creature by nature. But if fate should have that I am friendless, then I should welcome even that. However, since my health and reputation ultimately lay outside my choice, it is not good or bad to be healthy, it is indifferent. Good and bad lies only in how I respond to what befalls me, and I should always respond with wisdom, justice, courage, and moderation. That is correct, my winged friend. I have a special lesson for you now that the tree has asked me to deliver. Come with me. In the waking world, you often hear on places like Reddit that Stoicism is about controlling your emotions. But this isn't exactly true. Lucky for you, in the dreaming, we give you the real stuff. The stoic position on emotions is a bit more complicated than that. For starters, most people today equate emotions and feelings, but for the stoics, these are not equivalent. Epictetus took me to a nearby wooded trail to teach me this lesson. As we walked there, he was singing over and over, We're going on a bear hunt. We're gonna catch a big one. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Finally, he stopped when we heard a noise. Oh no, a bear! We should leave before it gets closer! No, wait. This bear will teach you how the Stoics view emotions. What do you feel right now? I feel scared! No, tell me what you feel in your body. I, I feel I am breathing faster and my heart is racing. Good. For the Stoics, a feeling is an awareness of a physiological response to something, like an elevated heart rate or queasiness in your stomach. These feelings have a sense of motivation to move towards or away from the thing that is triggering the feeling, just like you want to move away from the bear right now. Words like reaching or elevation describe the feeling of want for something, whereas contracted or withdrawing describe the sense we have towards things we wish to avoid. So, these feelings occur with emotions, but the emotion itself is defined in terms of one's beliefs. Do you believe it's bad to be eaten by a bear? Of course, I said, even though I just learned what happens to my body is neither good or bad. Can we go now? But he only continued. 
Right now, you're experiencing distress. For the Stoics, the emotion of distress is not just a feeling you have when being confronted by a bear, but something that is caused by your belief that such an event is bad and that it's appropriate to feel avoidant of bad things, with your belief that in fact you are now being confronted by a bear, so it's appropriate for you to be feeling avoidant right here and now. Huh? In other words, when you combine your feeling with your background beliefs that being confronted by a bear is bad, and that it's appropriate to feel avoidant of bad things, with your belief that you are currently confronted by a bear, then you can be said to have the emotion of distress over this bear. Now we can go, he said with a smile. The bear mysteriously started to walk away. As we entered back into the park, he continued his lecture. So, how does all this mean that the Stoics don't believe in controlling our emotions? Remember that the Stoics are about having knowledge. Those who have knowledge will only believe those things which are good are good, and things that are bad are bad, and things that are indifferent are indifferent. So a person with knowledge would not assent to the belief that being confronted by a bear is bad. Injury to your body falls into the category of indifference. Without this belief... They could not be said to even have the emotion of distress to control in the first place. That doesn't mean, however, that a person with knowledge would feel nothing when being charged by a bear. They could still have that feeling of avoidance with its elevated heart rate and breathing that anyone would have upon seeing a bear in the wild. These are feelings that come naturally from mechanisms that prime the body to survive. Since we have these physiological survival responses endowed by nature, to have them is in accordance with nature. Then what's the difference between someone who thinks it's bad to get eaten by a bear and someone who doesn't, besides their belief? Their emotions go beyond reason. Those who add incorrect belief to their feelings will experience the feeling of being carried away by their emotion that of having a momentum to the emotion that is difficult to stop or even elevate to a crescendo. One last question. Of course. So would the sage have no emotions at all? The sage has correct emotions, their own sort that only come from true beliefs. For example, a deep joy that comes from knowing you have done the right thing. For the sage, since they are living consistently with nature, they will truly know they did the right thing in a way that non-sages won't, which is enough to classify their emotions as being different from non-sages. I think I understand. He raised an eyebrow. Do you? Come with me for your final lesson. Let us observe what harmony really is. He took me to an area of the park where a band was setting up. Think of the word harmony. What does that remind you of? Hmm. Music, I said. That's right. Interestingly, us Stoics hold music as being superior to words in understanding nature. Cleanthes, the second head of the school, said, Even though the discourse of philosophy has the ability to express divine and human matters adequately, it does not as prose have expressions appropriate to the grandeur of the divine, while meters, melodies, and rhythms come closest to the truth of the contemplation of the divine. The band began to play. We listened as music notes filled the air. Put your glasses back on, Epictetus said to me. What do you see? I see ratios of the pneuma. That's because just like the universe, musical scales upon which melodies are based, along with rhythm and meter, are constructed with numerical ratios. But it's not only that melodies, meters, and rhythms are based on ratio that make music like the universe, but how they all fit together to create a piece of music. One can take those things and throw them together randomly. The result will be random noise rather than a holistic piece of music that is able to communicate emotions or convey beauty. So in a well-structured, ordered piece of music, we can similarly see how the cosmos fits together in a structured, orderly plan. In other words, because it is based on ratios that fit together, music can represent more directly the underlying nature of the cosmos. This is in contrast to words which only describe the structure. Yes, I understand, I exclaimed. 
Good. Now turn around and let's look at your last memory palace. Right before us is the first thing I want you to remember. The fork in this road represents the one thing that is in your power, choice. Which fork will you choose to value? The right, with externals such as fame and fortune, or the left, with the virtues? At the fountain, we see a representation of externals. We see people working out, getting healthy, and a group of friends hugging each other. Such externals are preferred, but not good, to have, and the fountain getting wet and pelted with water are dispreferred externals. We see a sick woman coughing and a poor man begging for money because we disprefer being sick and poor. But the woman dancing in the mud reminds us that if we knew whatever external circumstances we experienced were fated for us, and all those that have occurred were in fact fated, then we should joyously embrace them. Now at the lake we see a sage and a man being chased around in circles by a bear. The sage doesn't believe it is bad to be mauled by a bear because he knows it's indifferent. He is not distressed. The other man is terrified because he values his health as a good. And finally, I surely do not need to remind you of the band, which reminds us that the cosmos is like a piece of music, which fits together according to the proper ratios, and that we too want to fit in with the cosmos as an element of music fits in with the whole. I hope all this was helpful to you, my team and friend. It was, Epictetus. Thank you. And thank you, most of all, dreamer. I hope you found this dream as helpful as my own experience. Now wake and live in harmony.